Hi, I'm Patrick, and welcome back to ICIP, also known as grading essays quicker than Pennsylvania counts votes. Today, we will be looking at the um, first thing that the UN actually does. We had already learned about how, what the UN is, how it is structured, how it is built, and what its main organs are. So now let's come to the more interesting part, arguably, which is about what the UN actually provides us with and today we will be talking about the UN's role in keeping the peace. Maintaining international peace and security, we learned, was one of the major uh, goals that the UN was founded on, so that's what we'll be looking at today. So, um, we learned in the previous lecture that while the UN was built on the idea of collective security, what really came out of that process was a modified collective security arrangement. So it's not a pure collective security institution. We did learn that in the Charter and in the General Assembly, uh, those two things are very much led by a liberal vision. The Charter with its insistence that there's international law and international rules that should be valid for everyone, and the General Assembly with its idea of one state, one vote. Both are, are core uh, liberal thoughts. But we also heard that the Security Council constitutes the realist part of the UN. Um, in the sense that powerful states are still determining much of the agenda and in the Security Council they are privileged by their veto power. Um, we did hear that the founding thing, uh, the founding principle really of the UN is to maintain peace and security as outlined in the Charter in Chapter 1, Article 1. So. The UN's role then in stabilizing the world and pacifying conflicts, what does that actually look like? Well, we have two key passages in the Charter that deal with this specific instance of conflict. Um, chapter 6, Article 33 says that the parties to any dispute uh, which is likely to endanger the maintenance of international peace and security shall seek a solution by negotiation, la la la, or other peaceful means of their own choice. So if you have a conflict with someone, please take all the peaceful means you possibly can, exhaust all of those uh, before anything else happens. And it doesn't matter whether you use mediation or negotiation, arbitration, judicial settlement, it doesn't matter, as long as you stick to peaceful means only. So that's chapter six, peaceful means of conflict resolution. Then we have chapter seven, which comes in when chapter six breaks down when states are running out of peaceful options and when they think that they have to further escalate the conflict. And it says that the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace or act of aggression, and then can take measures in accordance uh, with Articles 41 and 42 that maintain or restore international peace and security. So once states run out of peaceful means, the UN or rather the Security Council, has the authority to step in and restore international peace and security. How can the Security Council do this? Under Chapter 7, um, it is empowered to take any action by air, sea, or land forces as are necessary to maintain the peace. So nothing's really out of the, uh, out of the equation. They can use anything that they want. And even more so, uh, chapter 7, Article 43 says that all members of the UN undertake uh, to make available to the Security Council their armed forces, any assistance, and facilities. So not enough that the Security Council can authorize any action, it can also call on all other member states. Because mind you, that doesn't say all members of the Security Council or any veto, veto powers, it says all members of the UN shall render assistance to the Security Council. So we have chapter six, which is the peaceful means of conflict resolution. We have chapter seven, which is the military means of conflict resolution or conflict resolution by force. And in doing so, the UN Security Council has really, really far ranging uh, options at its disposal. And it, it can call on all member states to also uh, support those measures. Now, obviously, the original idea for the UN was a very far-reaching one. The liberal idea had been to actually provide an international institution with a lot of force and a lot of authority and uh, to, in order to enable it to keep the peace and keep stability. And the idea was even floated to maintain a standing army, a UN army, that would then be able to uh, keep the peace. Now, these things, though, were non-starters because 
very soon after the Second World War, the Cold War began, and we realized fairly early on that the Security Council, the main institution that was charged with keeping the peace and with authorizing interventions, was deadlocked between the two powers in the Cold War, mostly the US, uh, the US and the USSR. So because the UN didn't want to be completely uninvolved in keeping the peace and uh, dealing with conflicts, we had to come up with a different idea. We had to come up with uh, what's been called a holding action born of necessity. So we couldn't rely on the Security Council always being in agreement to actually use Chapter 7 and start a full-on intervention. So the UN basically improvised. It proved to be flexible in interpreting its own rules and it came up with something that wasn't quite peaceful but also wasn't quite a Security Council mandated uh, intervention. So peacekeeping, the peacekeeping that we're talking about, is something that's an improvised action that is not originally in the Charter. So UN peacekeeping then, let's define that really quickly and we'll take that statement apart. So they're field operations, so that means the UN troops are actually in the field, in the conflict, physically there, in which international personnel, civilian and or military, so could be civilian forces such as police, or military forces, as we classically know, soldiers, tanks, and so on, are deployed, careful now, with the consent of the parties. So the conflict parties agree to, uh, to peacekeepers being there, and under UN command, so they're not going in there under German or French or US command, they have a UN commander, to help control and resolve actual or potential international conflicts, so they can be sent into not only into active conflict zones, but also to prevent something spiraling out of control or escalating. Or internal conflicts, which have a clear international dimension. Again, pretty far reaching, right? So the idea is that not only interstate conflicts, but also intrastate conflicts can be uh, ideally pacified through UN peacekeepers. And so this is a UN invention not intervention, invention, because the UN Charter actually doesn't mention peacekeeping anywhere. It's not something that was originally envisioned by the founders of the UN. And Doc Hammarskjöld has therefore called peacekeeping memorably a chapter six and a half activity. So much like in Harry Potter, there's a platform nine and three quarters that's between nine and 10, is chapter, uh, is UN peacekeeping, between chapter six, which is the peaceful means of conflict resolution, and chapter seven, which is a full-on uh, UN Security Council mandated uh, military intervention. So peacekeeping is a little more than peaceful, but it's a little less than full-on military intervention. And that's why it's a chapter six and a half. I mean, somewhat jokingly called six and a half activity. Where does UN peacekeeping happen then? So we know how it's defined. We know it's been around for a good while uh, because if Doc Hammarskjöld already talked about it, that was the second secretary general. So that must be all the way back in the 50s and 60s. So you see a map here of the world. In dark blue is the countries that currently have a UN peacekeeping mission. In light blue do you see countries that have previously had UN peacekeeping missions. And one or two things uh, might stick out here to you. We see that most of UN peacekeeping has really happened in Africa and in uh, the Middle East and South Asia. There's been a few missions in, uh, in Oceania and in Latin America and the Caribbean. And of course, there's been one mission in Europe uh, so far uh, with the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, uh, having peacekeepers there. But so the picture of peacekeeping is very much one of the global South. Peacekeeping doesn't really happen very much outside of Africa and uh, Central Asia is something that we've learned and it mostly involves, as we can see, uh, developing countries with very, very few exceptions. Now, what are UN peacekeeping forces then? What are key characteristics of UN peacekeepers? Well, they're small and lightly armed troops uh, and military observers, so they mostly look like you see here in the picture. They have blue helmets and they have white vehicles that say UN on them. Um, why that's uh, remarkable is that they are not a full-on military force. There is no UN uh, artillery, there's no UN predator drones, there's no UN intercontinental missiles. Those things are not part of that. They are always 
uh, lightly armed troops, mostly on foot or maybe on uh, with armored personnel carriers. They are not a heavy fighting force. That's not what they're there for. And they are mostly troops from neutral or non-aligned states. Um, not from any major powers, so that includes almost all the P5, uh, the Security Council uh, veto powers, and mm, for the most part, also not from neighboring countries of the conflict. Now, if I asked you to give me a top five of which country do you think provides the most troops for UN peacekeeping, what do you think would your top five be? Which states send the most soldiers on these peacekeeping missions? Okay, you know what? I'll make it easier for you. Give me the top country. What's the country that sends the most soldiers on US peacekeeping, uh, on UN peacekeeping missions? Was it Ethiopia? Probably not. I'm guessing that your top five probably also wasn't Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Rwanda, India, and Pakistan. You might have expected some European nations up there, maybe the Netherlands, maybe Sweden or so. Nope, they're not uh, significant enough to end up in the top 10 or top 15 even. Um, so we see here that mostly, for the most part, um, UN peacekeeping forces come from developing countries. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. We have already said that it might not be a good idea to have um, major powers, troops as UN peacekeepers, because those could be, maybe even with some justification, uh, they could be suspected of maybe not being neutral parties to the conflict. Um, and of course, that eliminates uh, already, and as we see here in the actual levels, in red I've marked the P5 veto powers, that eliminates most of the uh, P5. So France, the UK, Russia, and the US really send very, very few troops. I don't even know what those 53 US troops are. I would assume those are either uh, just training staff, so people that train other people in policing, for example, but those will not be soldiers because the US famously refuses to have any of their own soldiers under UN command. So it's mostly developing states that are willing to do this, and this is that because for the most part they don't have a bone in many of these conflicts. So Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Rwanda aren't really involved in very many conflicts outside of their immediate regions. The same goes for India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan, of course, have their own peacekeeping mission between their countries, but when you send Indian or Pakistani peacekeepers to Africa, for the most part, they are not suspected of taking any one side over another. And the thing that we realize here is that UN peacekeeping is very much a thing done by troops from developing countries in other developing countries. So almost all these top 15 are from the global south, uh, with many African and Asian states in there. Uh, sometimes very disproportionate to its own size. You see Nepal and Rwanda appear up there, uh, who of course don't have millions and millions of people as in their population, but they still send significant contingents. Some of these states send their troops because uh, for the duration of the mission, the UN carries the personnel costs, so they pay the salaries of these soldiers. That's sometimes not only a good deal for the soldiers, but also for the country sending them. But of course, there's all kinds of ethical dilemmas that come with that, because are we fine with UN peacekeeping being mostly provided by poor developing states? Um, the only permanent veto power that provides any significant amount of troops is China with two, around two and a half thousand. But you can see here that the top five or top six together account, uh, so that's all the way down to Nepal, together account for about 85% of all troops. So if you think UN peacekeeping troops, you shouldn't think of a German, a Swedish or a US soldier in a uniform. You should think of someone from Ethiopia, for example, being stationed in Haiti or someone from Pakistan being stationed in Sierra Leone. That's really what that story looks like. Now, there's a couple of principles that UN peacekeeping tends to follow. Uh, the three major ones of this traditional UN peacekeeping are UN peacekeepers are uh, under a guidance of the non-use of force. So except for self-defense and maybe in defense of the mandate, maybe to protect civilians, UN peacekeepers aren't supposed to actually use their weapons. They're not there to go in their guns blazing, uh, shoot everyone dead that's a part of the conflict and therefore pacify things. It's not the Wild West. They're not going in there, wee wee. Uh, I'm assuming they don't make that sound when they do it. Um, but they're not supposed to use their weapons really except for self-defense. 
they are supposed to uh, get the consent of the involved parties. Sometimes that's easier if you have two states, then both of the states, the governments agree that having UN peacekeepers uh, between them is a good idea. Sometimes it gets a little bit hairy when you have, for example, non-traditional combatants. What if you have a government on the one side, but a rebel force on the other? Still, UN peacekeeping operates on the assumption that you would get the consent of both parties because they might themselves have an interest in uh, pacifying the conflict. And then lastly, you have the principle of impartiality or neutrality. I've already talked about this in the previous slide. The idea is that the UN peacekeepers that are there aren't taking sides. So they're not really there to say prop of a government or support a rebel force, irrespective of how worthy we think the respective causes are. So the UN is trying very hard with its peacekeepers to not take sides in conflicts. Traditional UN peacekeeping has two main objectives, really. Traditional UN peacekeeping missions are either designed to keep the peace, so they are literally a buffer. Uh, it's much the same way as you go to a nightclub and some idiot tries to fight the bouncer and you get between the idiot and the bouncer. You provide a buffer because only the idiot has a problem with the bouncer, but the idiot doesn't have a problem with you. And ideally also the bouncer doesn't have a problem with you. So by inserting yourself in the middle of a conflict, you can then pacify it by keeping the two sides apart, essentially. So you and peacekeepers as a buffer. And then secondly, UN peacekeepers as a monitoring and reporting force. It becomes much easier, for example, for the two sides of the conflict to trust each other if they have a neutral observer in the middle that can say, for example, whether a, uh, a truce um, or a, a peace agreement is being uh, observed by both sides or whether there has been um, uh, instances where the, that truth, the truce has been violated by one side. So observing the peace is the big other thing that traditional UN peacekeepers are doing. So keeping the peace, being a buffer, and observing the peace, reporting on the situation, is how many of the really, really long-standing, very old missions of the UN's peacekeeping forces tend to go. We have a mission in the Middle East, in Israel, and the surrounding countries that's been there since 1948. So almost, what's that, 70? No, over 70 years now. Um, we have Yun Mogib in India and Pakistan. We know that the border region between India and Pakistan is prone to conflict between those two countries. And there's a UN peacekeeping force there has been there for 71 years that is designed to be a buffer and report on any violations of the agreements. And we have a force in Cyprus that's also been there for over 55 years that's kept the peace between the Greek side and the Turkish side on Cyprus. So that's what traditional UN peacekeeping looks like. Now, um, in the course of sort of the 90s, the 1990s, the um, international community kind of slowly came to the conclusion that traditional UN peacekeeping wasn't always the way to go. And this reignited the debate between the protection of sovereignty on the one side and the UN having to respect state sovereignty but on the other side, the need to protect human rights in maybe a greater number of different situations. Now, let's remind ourselves that chapter one, uh, article two says that nothing contained in the present charter shall also authorize the UN to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any one state. So that's the non-interference in domestic affairs clause. And what that means is that it tends to be the case that whatever happens inside your national borders is your own business. You are a sovereign state, you have sovereignty over your area, and that means that no one else should be able to come in there and tell you what to do. But, also says Article 2, this principle shall not prejudice the application of enforcement measures under Chapter 7. Remember, Chapter 7 is a UN Security Council mandated intervention in instances where international peace and security are threatened. So already in the Charter, there's a certain tension between wanting to protect sovereignty, but also already qualifying that sovereignty and saying that there are certain instances where that sovereignty has to be violated, essentially, has to be disregarded by the international community. Now, uh, an important step uh, towards getting a more broader, uh, a more broad, a more holistic understanding of, of the UN's role in keeping the peace came in 1992 in the report An Agenda for Peace, for Peace that was compiled by then Secretary General Boutros Boutros Khali. Um, in the report, it was distinguished between peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding. 
So peacekeeping is still the same things that we talked about already. But then the report also said that there were instances where peace had to be made first, where you didn't already have a stalemate essentially in a conflict into which you could neatly insert UN peacekeepers. No, you had to pacify that conflict first. You had to de-escalate and get those two sides apart first in order to then keep that peace. And then the, the, the third important concept is that occasionally you also, or actually not occasionally, in most cases, you also had to make sure that you were building a sustainable peace once you had kept that peace. So you had to create these situations, the infrastructure, the institutions, in order to not have the the conflict parties fall back into conflict after you take UN peacekeepers out. So we have to think about how to create resilient state institutions, how to provide for people's uh, needs and developments in order to take the reason away that uh, might have escalated into this conflict in the first place. And overall, the idea was really that the UN had to be more robustly involved in keeping the peace, that it was no longer enough in the increasingly complex conflict situations of the 90s um, and so on, uh, to only rely on peacekeeping as a, the only tool that the UN could use. And so there was a gradual move away from trying to only ever do chapter six and a half measures with peacekeeping and towards an understanding that the UN had more frequently, more frequently had to use chapter seven and to therefore move from peacekeeping to peace enforcement. And this idea that the UN had to be more deeply involved and that the UN's mandate had to be more robust was also summarized under the term of second generation peacekeeping. Now, under this idea of second generation peacekeeping, we saw a fairly quick expansion of the UN's involvement in conflicts around the world. While there had only been around 18 operations in the 40 plus years between 1948 and 1989, there were 35 operations in the decade after 1990 alone. Partially, this was driven by the collapse of the um, uh, Cold War situation that created a lot of smaller conflicts in, uh, in the periphery of those previous blocks. The idea here was that um, in under second generation peacekeeping, the downgrading of the principle of explicit consent. So what that meant was the thinkers that were uh, tackling this issue of how to get the UN more involved in different types of conflict said that we couldn't always rely on all the parties to a conflict to necessarily agree to insert UN peacekeepers. So always getting explicit consent was occasionally either not feasible or might not even have been possible um, because it wasn't always all that clear who was a party to these conflicts, especially in the very protracted conflicts uh, in intrastate situations. But the hope was that even where we downgraded the principle of explicit consent and we more robustly went in earlier into conflict situations with our peacekeepers, that we could still uphold the other two principles, namely that the UN could still be impartial uh, towards the parties of the conflict and that the UN could rely on the non-use of force so that its peacekeepers could be a peaceful um, actor in the middle acting like a buffer. But as some really highly problematic cases showed fairly quickly after the idea of second generation peacekeeping came up, this was much harder to achieve in practice than it was in theory. So let's look at a few problem cases here and let's see uh, how these cases revealed that each of the traditional principles of UN peacekeeping uh, was kind of not always uh, applicable in all of these situations. So the first case is Bosnia. We know that the um, uh, Yugoslavia fell apart after the end of the Cold War. It fell apart in several constituent states. Some of them, uh, some of them achieved their independence relatively easily, such as Slovenia. Some of them uh, won their independence after a relatively short war, such as Croatia. But then we uh, came to a situation where there was a protracted war between Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was a former province of Yugoslavia. Uh, a UN peacekeeping force had been sent in there in 1992 and it immediately had the problem of what it was it supposed to do. There was no peace to keep. The, the conflict was still actively going on. The two sides were actively fighting a war here uh, with everything from paramilitary forces to artillery and airstrikes. Uh, 
And so the situation from the outset was a really difficult one because this was not a stalemate. This was not a frozen conflict into which you and peacekeepers had to be, uh, it could be inserted. The problems with the mission uh, really culminated in 1995. The UN had set up a safe haven in the Bosnian town of Srebrenica. Uh, it was designed to be essentially a big camp into which civilians could flee and they would then be protected by UN peacekeepers, mostly from the Netherlands. The problem was, though, that the Serbian paramilitaries that got wind of this safe haven basically just ignored the UN peacekeeping forces. They didn't really care that they were there. They shot at them. They attacked them in other ways. And it became clear fairly quickly that the UN peacekeepers would not have the necessary force to turn back the Serbian assault on this safe haven. And it culminated in a massacre over a number of days where Serbian forces essentially went into the camp. They separated out over 8,000 Bosnian men and boys, all of them Muslims, uh, and they took them away to be executed uh, in, a, in a, a massive massacre and, of course, uh, a case of genocide. Um, and the Dutch peacekeeping troops that were there did simply not have the necessary firepower and not the necessary will and the mandate to intervene here and actually protect the citizens they were sent to protect in the first place. A big international outcry over the situation ensued. The Dutch state itself acknowledged later that its peacekeepers had essentially been somewhat complicit by not attempting more uh, towards protecting these civilians under their care. And this situation, this massacre, was a key in turning international, the international community towards using more force. And uh, this culminated, of course, in the air campaign run by NATO against Serbia that then got Serbia to capitulate. An air campaign, by the way, that did not happen under with a UN mandate and that was um, run by NATO rather than UN peacekeeping forces. Uh, so here, the problem was simply that the non-use of force principle didn't really apply. You couldn't have peacekeepers in situations where they were explicitly told to only defend themselves, but then they were not able to defend the civilians under their care. So the first principle uh, was shown in Bosnia to be highly problematic. The second case that we had was Rwanda. Now, Rwanda had a difficult uh, ethnic situation in that you had the uh, Hutu and the Tutsi ethnic groups. There was rumors of a, of a civil war and there was a UN peacekeeping mission sent in there in 1993, uh, Yunamir. Um, but <clears throat> when it became clear in early 1993 that the ethnic tensions would um, escalate into all-out ethnic warfare, um, the UN peacekeepers asked for reinforcements that were uh, that were not given and the uh, additional forces that were in the area weren't given a robust enough mandate. It ended up with peacekeepers getting attacked by paramilitary forces uh, from the uh, Hutu ethnic group that then proceeded over the course of really only about a hundred days, so three and a half months, to kill in the most brutal fashion over 800,000 Tutsi in Rwanda. Rwanda is a small country, so this was essentially neighbors killing neighbors. Um, and this was also not an industrialized genocide like we've known it from other dark episodes of, of the 20th century, such as Nazi Germany. This was literally just um, people getting killed one by one. Uh, a genocide at an unprecedented scale in the 20th century in terms of its rapidity. Now, the problem was that the UN didn't really deal with this. The, both the speed of the situation developing overtook the capacity of the UN Security Council to intervene. But also, at least Kofi Annan puts it that way, the international community could not muster the political will to confront this genocide. The UN Security Council simply couldn't bring itself to label this a genocide and to launch a full-on military intervention with the aim of stopping this. Um, essentially, the, the genocide ran out after a while. Uh, French troops went in and, and uh, did their part in pacifying the the conflict, but overall it's one, maybe the biggest failure of the UN ever since its creation was that it was not able to do anything about this genocide at such a massive scale. There's a great and very consequential article written by Samantha Powers, who was the US permanent representative at the UN under Barack Obama, and the article is called Bystanders to Genocide, because that was very much the feeling that um, 
the, the world had towards the UN and towards the states in the Security Council, that they had been happy to stand at the sidelines and watch the genocide unfold because they couldn't be bothered, essentially, to intervene in this conflict. Um, so the problem here was that even where troops uh, were, even when troops were there, there was no way that the UN could be impartial towards two sides if the one side was committing a genocide against the other. Uh, one of the biggest failings of the UN still uh, and led to many changes uh, in how the UN even conceived of itself, uh, of its own role in, the, in peacekeeping. And the third case is Somalia. If you've seen Black Hawk Down, you know the situation in Somalia in the 90s. It was essentially a failed state. There was no a viable central government. Uh, the central government at times didn't even hold the majority of the capital of Mogadishu, which you see here on the right. There had been two, uh, three UN missions actually being sent into Somalia to stabilize the country, UNISOM 1, UNISOM 2, and UNITAF. Uh, under the uh, idea that this would be a humanitarian intervention, so to protect civilians from further violence by the warlords that were vying for the control of the country and of the capital. But because the situation was so uh, overwhelmingly complex and so, uh, so messy on the ground, this led to over 150 peacekeepers being killed in action here. Uh, U.S. troops were also attacked. That is, of course, what Black Hawk Down, the movie, is about. U.S. troops were also attacked, and this led to the U.N. withdrawing all its troops by 1995 because it became clear that the U.N. peacekeeping forces, such as they were, could not pacify this type of conflict. Mostly this was because there was no such thing as consent being given by all parties. The parties here were not only, there was not only many of them parties to this conflict, but many of them had simply no interest in de-escalating the conflict. They didn't want UN peacekeepers there. Um, so the principle of consent didn't really apply here. And again, this was a this was really a, a failure of how uh, the UN conceived of peacekeeping and what peacekeeping could do, that it could not do anything to, to uh, stop the slide of Somalia into uh, lawlessness and instability. I don't want to make this sound like ISIB is always this dark corner of your IR knowledge, so I do want to acknowledge, at least for a slide here, uh, the idea that the UN's peacekeeping uh, missions have also had uh, quite great successes really all around the world. So I do want to mention these just really quickly. We had UN peacekeeping forces in Cyprus. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the, the uh, Turkish forces staged an invasion in the uh, predominantly Greek Cyprus and there it was a republic being founded in the northern part of it uh, that's only recognized by Turkey and UN peacekeeping forces were inserted into this conflict to stop any further bloodshed and that mission has at least been successful not necessarily in terms of resolving the, the situation but at least there hasn't been any uh, all-out war or further conflict ever since it uh, got there in the 1960s and 1970s. There was a very successful mission in East Timor, uh, UNAMET and UNTAIET. Uh, the goal here was that to oversee the uh, gradual uh, letting uh, become independent of East Timor. East Timor was previously a province of Indonesia. It wanted its independence and UN peacekeepers went in there to prevent this from escalating into a civil war. And they also oversaw a, a referendum on independence, which was now, which ended positively, meaning that East, Timor's, East Timorians voted for their independence from Indonesia, and all of this was settled through uh, without further bloodshed. Two successful missions in Sierra Leone and Burundi could also be mentioned. Sierra Leone was a disarmament and peacekeeping mission in a country that had previously been at risk of sliding into civil conflict. So the, uh, the sides to the conflict were disarmed, and this mission also had an explicit mandate to protect civilians, Clearly, the UN had learned at least that lesson uh, from the genocide in Rwanda and that it did not want another situation in Africa to escalate into that. The mission of, in Burundi, UNUB, uh, ran for three years and protected a peace agreement there. And today, Burundi is a relatively stable uh, African state. So there have been, and this is, of course, only a selection. There have been other missions that arguably have also been successful at achieving their goals. Now, um, in the early 2000s, a process began inside the UN that attempted to learn from uh, 
the traditional peacekeeping from the second generation peacekeeping that had run into so much trouble in the 90s in those problem cases that I showed you. And the result was the creation of an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty. Now, this commission came up with two key concepts here to understand better what the role of the UN could be in um, dealing with conflicts. It came up with the principle of the humanitarian intervention, which is a more broader term of the UN being responsible for uh, protecting uh, citizens, uh, civilians in conflicts. And it came up with the responsibility to protect, which was a more sharply defined term, which said that in specific, under specific circumstances, in specific situations, the UN, the international community, actually had a responsibility to step in. It didn't just have the choice to do so, it had a responsibility. Both of these really challenged the norm of non-intervention. So we saw that in the charter, non-intervention is an important part of it. Domestic affairs, you know, that's all your own stuff. Um, but these two things challenged this by saying that the, the norm of non-intervention was an absolute one. So the idea here was that there had been a shift really in how we thought about state sovereignty over the course, uh, the latter half of the 20th century. And we came to think about sovereignty not just as a right that states have, not just as a shield against all outside interference, but also as a responsibility of those states towards their own citizens. So sovereignty isn't a right, it's also a responsibility. You have the responsibility to protect and foster your own citizens. And when you as a state violate that responsibility, it then gets transferred to the international community who then is responsible for protecting your own citizens if you can't do it or if you are the reason for why they are under threat. This is, of course, a very fundamental rethinking of the whole idea of sovereignty. And out of the commission and these two concepts uh, came the uh, empirical observation that since 2000, almost every peacekeeping mission now has a robust mandate to use the force to protect civilians. So to not let anything like Rwanda or Bosnia happen ever again. Now, I just want to re-emphasize how much of a big deal it is that we came up with this concept of the responsibility to protect. So as the Office of the Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide put it, sovereignty no longer exclusively protects states from foreign interference. It is a charge of responsibility that holds states accountable for the welfare of their people. So no longer can you be, you know, some tin pot dictator uh, torturing, disappearing and killing your citizens. If you violate your responsibility towards your citizens to protect them, it becomes automatically the responsibility of the international community to stop those things from happening and thereby stop you as a state from doing them. And Anne-Marie Slaughter uh, former policy uh, director of the State Department, the U.S. State Department under Hillary Clinton, said that this constituted the most important shift in the conception of sovereignty since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. The Treaty of Westphalia is often considered to be the birth of the modern nation-state system. 450 years later, the R2P principle, responsibility to protect principle, um, ch challenges this notion that sovereignty is really an absolute norm. It says that sovereignty has to be qualified and that it is, as a, as it is a responsibility to. Now, because this is such a dramatic shift, uh, it was specified that R2P should only apply in very specific situations. Um, now, if you want to stop the video here for the uh, traditional minute, um, think about which situations, which instances of what states tend to do, which terrible things that they do, do you think merit that responsibility to protect principle to come into force and the international community to have to intervene and stop them. So what is bad enough for R2P to apply? Think about that for a second. Cat's not dead, by the way, it's just asleep. Okay, so here's the answer. Um, it was specified that R2P should really only apply in four very specific cases. The first one was the case of war crimes. So if child soldiers were being used, if human shields were being used, something that my colleague Nicola Perugini here in PIR has written a whole book about. Uh, maybe if you can catch one of his uh, honor seminars, if you're interested in this uh, specific uh, issue. Uh, 
or if you execute prisoners of war, there's other things, of course, that are war crimes, um, then R2P should apply. So if you commit war crimes, the international community has a responsibility to protect those that you commit those crimes against and has a responsibility to intervene against you. Then genocide, the eradication of a people, you want to um, uh, essentially kill off a, a group of people. Um, you commit ethnic cleansing, uh, which is the forced removal or eradication of an ethnic or religious group. So mind you, for this, technically, you don't have to kill those people. Uh, it is enough, quotation marks, if you remove them from your territory. The term comes out of the war in Yugoslavia, where, for example, uh, Bosnian uh, Muslims were uh, ethnically cleansed, which is just a terrible word, ethnically cleansed from areas that Serbia wanted to take over. Uh, or if you commit crimes against humanity. Now, this is a really interesting category. So this is systematic attacks, widespread ones, against civilian populations. Oftentimes, these are conducted by governments. One classic example of this is forced disappearances. This uh, was a big deal in uh, Latin America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where people were disappeared, um, and their families and other people were never told what happened to them. These kinds of crimes against humanity are possible in peacetime. So you don't even have to be in a war or in a conflict. If you commit crimes against humanity, then the R2P principle applies and the international community now has the responsibility to step in and stop that. Now, because these uh, this rethinking was so dramatic, um, but because the underlying crimes and, and atrocities it was designed to stop were so universally accepted, UN member states supported R2P as a principle at the 2005 World Summit, but they were a little bit afraid that it was going too far, that it pushed the needle too far out one side. So there was a couple of changes introduced to the principle that was, were intended to water it down. R2P wasn't supposed to apply for simple violations of human rights. So say if your human right to vote or something was uh, was was violated, that wasn't considered enough. It was also probably not enough if there was a very small group of people that this applied to. Again, I don't want to say a number, but let's see if five people have been mistreated, that's probably not enough to launch a full-out invasion uh, or intervention against your country. States also said that there shouldn't be an automatic intervention. So there couldn't be an automatic uh, process where once it had been established that uh, these crimes had been committed, then automatically an intervention would be launched. It was still left to the Security Council to authorize such actions under the R2P principle. So states were trying to water the principle down because they, maybe some of them felt a little threatened by it. Nonetheless, uh, despite these changes, uh, the uh, principle of R2P has been continuously re referenced by the Security Council. I've just given you a quick little a sample here. In the case of Sudan, Mali, Congo, Liberia, and so on. Uh, we've had over 80, I want to see probably up to 90 Security Council resolutions since then. It's been only 15 years that have explicitly referenced R2P as either being applicable or as being the, the basis on which to uh, then intervene under a UN mandate. The first time this was actually used for a proper intervention was in Libya 2011 under Gaddafi, um, who was of course removed uh, from power uh, during the UN intervention there or the, the UN mandated intervention there and eventually even killed by the uh, opposition forces. Now, some states aren't quite that happy about R2P as a principle. They have certain reservations. Um, this is, for the most part, among the P5 powers, China and Russia. Uh, while France, the UK and the US tend to uh, support the R2P principle, but there's also plenty of other states that are skeptical towards it as a principle. Now, first, you could ask, is this not pushing the needle out, uh, pushing the needle too much over in one direction? haven't we gone from a situation where sovereignty is absolute to a situation where sovereignty is really not worth anything at all because once the international community establishes that you've violated some r2p principle violated or committed those crimes then you basically automatically lost your sovereignty an interesting point is also whether or not this encourages a logic of confrontation so you know that old uh, saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. 
once we say that R2P applies, does that not lead us to always think about conflicts as needing military intervention to solve them? And does that not encourage us to not think creatively maybe about what else we could do to um, entice states to stop committing these crimes, for example, and get them back in line? We've also seen already, uh, most famously in the case of Libya, that R2P mandated actions have the potential at least to go beyond, of, uh, beyond their original mandate. In the case of Libya, for example, the UN uh, mandate didn't necessarily specify a bombing campaign. It also certainly didn't uh, say that once captured, the former dictator Muammar Gaddafi could basically just be summarily executed at the side of a road. Uh, that was an unlawful killing and it wasn't mandated um, by the UN. So um, these, these three things taken together already should make us at least think a little harder about whether we think R2P is always the right principle to apply. We could also, of course, maybe from a more IR uh, theoretical perspective, ask what happens when a state is not isolated, for example? What happens when the state in question that's committing these crimes has powerful allies that could be drawn into the conflict? Do we still want R2P to apply here? Or when it is too isolated? Um, some have said that in the case of Rwanda, that the international community was so unwilling to intervene against that genocide was that they simply considered Rwanda not important enough. As cynical as that sounds, Rwanda wasn't a great con a security concern for anyone and it wasn't a big economic power with whom we wanted to cooperate. So what if it's too isolated? Um, and of course, lastly, we also mustn't forget that anything that we mandate under R2P means that there is costs. And I mean costs in terms of human lives. So despite our best intentions and the best possible mandate, there will be people killed as an, as an effect of an intervention. This can include soldiers, but it can also incur civilian costs, of course. So uh, we're, we should probably try to not be too trigger happy with R2P based interventions. I also want to uh, quickly mention another kind of uh, not so great uh, chapter in UN peacekeeping, and that is that UN peacekeepers at times have themselves actually been the problem rather than been the solution to the problem. So um, uh, without going any details into any details here, uh, so no trigger warning hopefully is necessary, uh, we have seen that UN peacekeeping forces in the past have been accused and also been proven to be uh, to have committed sexual assault, both against the civilian population, but also against other peacekeepers. An issue, of course, that's rampant in all the militaries in the world. So we shouldn't think that this would be any different among UN peacekeepers, but also that they were involved in sex trafficking, that there has been instances of corruption among UN peacekeeping forces, and even uh, that they sometimes are a public health concern. There was a case where UN peacekeepers in Haiti, in their own camp, uh, at the side of a river didn't follow proper hygiene standards and the river was polluted and downstream uh, Haitian civilians then had a massive cholera outbreak uh, uh, based in large part on the presence of the UN peacekeepers there and the, problem that they, the problems that they commit. So let's not forget that while we think that UN peacekeeping might well be a good thing, UN peacekeepers are also occasionally part of the problem. Now, uh, with this slightly dark note here, I'm just going to leave you uh, on this last slide. Let's think uh, for a second about what's the future for UN peacekeeping. So we can probably anticipate that both the number but also the complexity of these missions will increase. We won't have any fewer conflicts, is my guess at least, but the conflicts in which UN peacekeepers are sent are increasingly complex because inter-state wars have gone down while intra-state wars have gone up. So you have rebel forces, you have paramilitary forces. It's not those classic, you know, two states are standing on two sides of a sand dune and shooting artillery at each other. Um, the UN is trying to set up more concrete and more institutionalized cooperation schemes at the moment. So the UN is trying very hard to have regional organizations take a part of the load. So for example, in Africa, the African Union has been very involved in peacekeeping has its own peacekeeping forces. And the idea is that oftentimes a regional organization will be better suited to de-escalating conflicts in its region, both because of a greater familiarity with the, uh, with the region, but also because they're simply closer to it. Um, 
despite all the failures from Bosnia all the way to Somalia of UN peacekeeping, we still mustn't forget that UN peacekeeping has been successful in, in many missions, uh, even though they took longer than anticipated. Uh, they have managed to keep the peace uh, in a number of situations. And IR research has shown that uh, the presence of UN peacekeepers dramatically and significantly reduces the risk of another war breaking out. So they do at least achieve, in many cases, the mission that they were sent to, um, sent there for. But uh, we still uh, must uh, remember that the success of any UN peacekeeping always depends on the ability to get the parties to consent to it happening and the need to also include peace building measures. So it's not enough to just go in, pacify the conflict really quick and then get out again. The UN must be just as involved in building the peace as it is in keeping the peace. So creating a viable institutions for after the conflict is over. So that was a, a quick look into UN peacekeeping, what it's done, what it hasn't done, and the challenges that remain. Um, uh, next time we will look at the issue of human rights, which is of course closely linked to UN peacekeeping because much of uh, when UN peacekeeping comes into effect is based on whether or not human rights have been violated. So we'll think about the role of human rights at the UN and what the UN, the role that the UN has played uh, in protecting those human rights. I will see you in the next one. Cheers.